Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the first section for the fifth module of the History of Christianity II course. In the previous modules, we looked at the Protestant Reformation on continental Europe and some of the reactions to it. In this module and the next, we'll look at how the church in England changed and reformed as a result. In this first section, we'll explore the beginnings of the English Reformation. This is often rightly considered part of the same movement as the Protestant Reformation in Europe, but it was not the same as the Reformation on the continent, although it had similar results. The Reformation on the continent started with a change of theological ideas and impacted the political and social realities. The Reformation in England started with political changes and eventually impacted the theology and practices of the English churches. So I'll start with an explanation of the politics and a succession of political leaders, and then show how the church and its theology was affected. But first, we'll look at the timeline to give an overview of how all these things fit into the broader history we've already covered. Henry VIII reigned over England from 1509 through 1547. In 1533, he annulled his first marriage. In 1534, the Act of Supremacy was passed, declaring Henry the head of the English Church, not the Pope. Henry's son, Edward VI, had a short reign from 1547 through 1553. In 1549, the Act of Uniformity made the Book of Common Prayer the rule for English churches. Mary Tudor reigned from 1553 through 1558, and she began to persecute Protestants in 1554. Then Elizabeth I reigned from 1558 through 1603, and the Elizabethan settlement went into effect in 1559. Those are some of the main events that we will now examine in more detail. But first, we'll briefly look at some of the ways that England was prepared beforehand for this historical shift. In the History of Christianity I course, we saw the reforming ministry of John Wycliffe, and his influence was still around in England in the form of his followers called the Lollards. And in the meantime, news and information from Germany, and to a lesser extent Switzerland, was coming to England through trade, and Luther's writings were known in England. Some in England had become followers of the Reformation, and that included William Tyndall, who translated much of the Bible into English from exile in Holland, where he was killed for doing so. While still in England, Tyndall was confronted by a church leader for translating and teaching the Bible, and he responded, If God spare my life, before many years I will cause a boy who drives a plow to know more of the scriptures than you do. And just before he was executed, he prayed, Lord, open the King of England's eyes. And that brings us to the King of England, named Henry VIII. Henry is a key player in this story. Henry's character and attitude can be summed up by one quote. He once said, I do not choose anyone to have it in his power to command me, nor will I ever suffer it. Henry wanted to be the boss, responsible to no one, and that eventually led him to break the English church away from Roman Catholicism. Not over doctrine, not over forms of worship, but over control. And the reasons behind this are like a cheesy soap opera. Henry wanted to annul his marriage to Catherine of Aragon. This was not primarily because he disliked his first wife. It was apparently a relatively good marriage, but because she had not given him a male heir. They had a number of children, most of whom either were stillborn or died in infancy, but they had a girl who lived named Mary, and stay tuned for her story. And Henry also had become enamored with another woman. So Henry and his advisors argued that his first marriage was not legitimate because she had briefly been married to Henry's older brother before he died, and Henry had only been able to marry her with special permission from the Pope. I told you this was soap opera quality stuff. So Henry asked the current Pope to overrule the previous Pope and declare the marriage invalid. However, the Pope refused to do this for two main reasons. First, 
To disagree with the earlier pope would bring the question of papal infallibility into question. But more importantly, Henry's wife was related to the Emperor Charles V, whom the pope could not afford to anger at that time. So, in order to get out of his first marriage and marry the other woman, Henry's advisors suggested that he reject the pope, the pope's opinion, and his authority over England wholesale. So, Henry rejected the pope's authority in order to marry the other woman. Now, just as a side note, the other woman did not give Henry a male heir, and she was later rejected and beheaded. And that's a warning to us all. Don't be the other woman or the other man who breaks up a marriage. Not only is it immoral, which it is, but if they'll throw away their spouse for you, what makes you think they won't throw you away for someone else? Now back to Henry's story. England passed the Act of Supremacy in 1534, and this makes the king, quote, the only supreme head on earth of the Church of England. Henry took over church-owned lands in England and closed monasteries. Now, to be clear, Henry was not Protestant, and he did none of these things for Protestant reasons, even though some of his advisors were privately in sympathy with Luther and his reforms. Henry himself kept all Roman Catholic doctrine and forms of worship. He just rejected papal authority. Henry personally was against Luther and the Protestant Reformation. In fact, earlier he had been awarded the title of Defender of the Faith by the Pope for his writings against Luther and the Reformation. But Henry did allow his underlings to move in a slightly Reformed direction as much as was necessary to break away from Rome. Remember, there was much communication between England and the continent, and they knew what was going on, and many in England wanted to join it. For the most part, Henry put the brakes on hard against any of that kind of reform. However, he did allow a few concessions. The most important was called the Great Bible. Henry authorized the translation of the Bible into English and required a copy in every English church. This Great Bible was largely based on Tyndall's earlier translation. And then Henry eventually died with the Church of England formally separated from the Roman Catholic Church, and the door was opened for reform in the Protestant direction. And Henry was followed by his son from his third wife, named Edward VI. His son was named Edward, his third wife was named Jane Seymour. And Edward became king at nine years old. Edward and his advisors were much more reformed and they allowed much change in the Reformed direction. Thomas Cranmer was the primary author of the Book of Common Prayer, which became the prescribed liturgy for all English churches by the Act of Uniformity in 1549. The first edition of this Book of Common Prayer moved the churches in a Protestant direction, and the revised edition of 1552 was decisively Protestant, taking out all Roman ceremony and theology from the sacraments, for example. There was also a document called the 42 Articles, which set out the theological basis of the English Church. And Edward and his advisors brought in Protestant scholars from Europe to teach Protestantism in Oxford and Cambridge, so that clergy would be trained as Protestants not as Roman Catholics. So, England was moving in a decidedly Protestant direction during the reign of Edward. However, Edward died early at the age of 16, and he was succeeded by his half-sister, by Henry's first wife, Mary I, and she's also known as Mary Tudor. And she received the nickname of Bloody Mary, for reasons we'll see in a minute. Mary Tudor was Roman Catholic, both in her personal sympathies, but especially out of necessity to secure her right to rule. Because if Henry was right and the Pope was wrong, her mother was not married to Henry and she was not the rightful heir to the throne. But if the Pope was right, her mother was married to Henry and she was the legitimate ruler. 
and therefore Mary sought to undo all that had been done toward Reformation. She reversed the act of supremacy and most of the changes done under Edward, and she persecuted Protestants and killed many of their leaders, which is why she's often called Bloody Mary. John Rogers and Hugh Latimer, people of high authority under Edward, were among the first Protestant martyrs under Mary, and they made no compromise and no recantation of their Protestant faith, even under threat of torture and death, as they thought that would be treason to Christ. They reasoned, we cannot give an inch without being unfaithful to Jesus. And Thomas Cranmer was also killed by Mary. Their martyrdom actually strengthened the English Protestants in their resolve. And a famous book called Fox's Book of Martyrs was written to include these martyrs under Mary in the same category and tradition as all of the martyrs of the previous centuries. And many English Protestants ran away to the continent, especially to Geneva and to the Netherlands, which were staunchly reformed by that time. A man named William Ames, who was an early leader, spent time in the Netherlands, where he taught and wrote a book called The Marrow of Theology. This is basically an English systematic theology, similar in purpose to Calvin's Institutes, a systematic discussion of biblical truth. And I read this a few years back, and it was life-giving to my soul. It's rich stuff. His book is definitely not a stale textbook, and I highly recommend it. Ames describes theology as the doctrine of living for God. And English Protestants on the continent also produced the Geneva Bible. This was an English translation of the Bible with Protestant notes, which was smuggled into England and became very popular. And then Mary eventually died. Mary was succeeded by her half-sister, Elizabeth, daughter of Henry's second wife. Elizabeth was Protestant by sympathy and of necessity. She was the mirror opposite of Mary in the if the Pope was right, Elizabeth's mother was not married to Henry and she was not the rightful ruler, so Elizabeth sided with the break from Rome. She reinstated the act of supremacy, saying that she, not the Pope, was in charge of the English Church. And she was very suspicious of Roman Catholics, and rightly so, because there were a number of assassination plots against her by those in England with Roman Catholic sympathies. The Pope excommunicated Elizabeth and wrote that any who assassinated her with, quote, the pious intention of doing God's service, not only does not sin, but gains merit. In effect, the Pope put a hit out on Elizabeth. And Spain tried to invade England to reestablish Roman Catholicism, but their armada was destroyed partly by the English fortunately catching their ships close together in port and sending burning ships full of gunpowder into the harbor, and partly by a series of fierce storms that destroyed a lot of their fleet. And the English saw this defeat of the Spanish Armada, which vastly outnumbered and outmatched the English, as a sign of divine intervention on behalf of the Protestant cause. But Elizabeth herself was more moderate. She seemed to want to make room for all Protestants, and she allowed Roman Catholics as long as they did not rebel or deny her right to rule. As long as they obeyed the laws, they would not be molested or forced to deny conscience. Elizabeth tried to stop the bloody pendulum swing of the past few years between Protestant, back to Catholic, and back to Protestant. This led to what has been called the Elizabethan Settlement. The Elizabethan Settlement is illustrated by four documents. First is the Act of Supremacy. We already saw that this formalized in law that the supreme head of the church is Elizabeth the Queen, and every civil leader and every church leader, every minister had to take an oath that said, I do utterly testify and declare on my conscience that the Queen's Highness is the only supreme governor of this realm, as well in all spiritual or ecclesiastical things or causes. In other words, 
what Elizabeth says goes, in all things, civil and religious. This basically made Elizabeth the English Pope. This definitely was not yet complete freedom of worship. It was maybe a small step in that direction, but primarily it was a large step away from Roman control. Now, the second document was the Act of Uniformity. This was the law that said, basically, that every church in England has to believe and worship exactly the same way, as defined by Elizabeth and written in the Book of Common Prayer. And there were stiff penalties for worshiping, preaching, and leading a service in any other way. And the third document was the Book of Common Prayer. Now, we already saw that the original version was written by Thomas Cranmer during Edward's reign and then updated in a much more reformed direction in 1552. But Elizabeth issued a compromise version in 1559 that was not quite as reformed or anti Roman Catholic. This book was the liturgy for all English worship. It included the service outlines and ritual for all occasions. And there is much great and profound stuff there. And the prayer book has had profound effect on many English speaking churches afterwards. For instance, the traditional marriage ceremony, the one that begins, Dearly beloved, we're gathered here today, that is straight out of the prayer book. Now, like I said, this was updated as part of the Elizabethan settlement, but it was one size fits all and also solidified traditional rituals. And the final document was the 39 Articles. This was an updating of the earlier 42 Articles, and it became the Creed and Confession of the Church of England. And the Anglican Church today still gives lip service at least to the 39 Articles, although many parts of the modern Anglican Church are totally apostate. The 39 Articles are standard confessional stuff. We believe in God, Christ, the Trinity, etc. But they also contained standard Reformed theology. In other words, they were clearly Protestant rather than Roman Catholic. And they were Calvinist rather than Arminian, which distinction we'll examine in the next section. And the result of these documents is called the Elizabethan Settlement. And that brought some stability to England and the English Church. The violent religious swings of the prior years settled down. And the stability was helped by the fact that Elizabeth reigned for a long time. The settlement allowed more Protestant Reformed Calvinistic theology. In other words, there was a decisive move away from Roman Catholicism. But it was not yet as fully Reformed as it was on the continent. It was moving in that direction away from Rome, but not yet like Germany, the Netherlands, or Switzerland. But the English Church kept the worship liturgy, ritual, and church governance structure more traditional as much as possible, and that it included retaining much Roman ritual that was unacceptable to the Reformation and those in England with Protestant leanings. So, like every good compromise, it left nobody completely satisfied. And that set the stage for further events, which we'll cover in the next module. So, We'll leave the English church history there and come back and pick it up later. At the same time, there was Reformation in Scotland to the north. At that time, Scotland was a different but closely related country to England. We won't take the time to go into all the political twists and turns of Scotland. But the main point is that Scotland became reformed, largely through the ministry of a man named John Knox who had studied at the Geneva Academy under Calvin's successors, he went back to Scotland and basically won the church over to the Reformed faith, even by standing up against Mary Stuart, a different Queen Mary who was Queen of Scotland at that time. And so Scotland became even more staunchly Reformed than England at that time. Now, let's pause to review what you've learned about the Reformation so far. I said Reformations, plural, for a reason. There are a few groups I want to mention and review. There was the Protestant Reformation, 
This was primarily in Germany and Switzerland under leaders like Luther, Zwingli, and Calvin, and this spilled over into other parts of Northern Europe like Scandinavia, the Netherlands, and parts of France. There was the Anabaptist Radical Reformation. There was the Roman Catholic Counter Reformation, as typified in the Council of Trent. And now, there is the English Reformation under the leadership of Henry VIII and people like Thomas Cranmer. And the questions for review in all of these reformations is, what changed? What did each of these accomplish? What was different from the way the medieval Roman Catholic Church was before each movement? Now, let's compare and contrast the different reformations. First, the Protestants. They definitely changed the church's theology with ideas like justification by faith and the five solas. They changed the authority of the church. They insisted on the Bible as the final authority, not the church organization, not the church leaders. And they changed many of the rituals of the church. They changed the preaching, worship, and liturgy to some extent. And all of life changed in some way based on their newfound theology. But by the way, we mentioned they didn't change everything. Remember, Luther wanted to change from the inside out, not reject everything. They only changed what was necessary and had good biblical reason for change. And finally, they worked to challenge and fix abuses such as indulgences and church leaders who were not godly or competent. The Protestant Reformation, like the name says, both protested against Rome and reformed the theology and practices of the church. Next is the Anabaptists. And this is more difficult to say because there was such a variety in the Radical Reformation. But in terms of theology, they definitely changed. In some ways, they changed more than the Protestants. But in other ways, they were more similar to the medieval church in their theology of salvation. They definitely changed more of the rituals and practices of the church, and they also worked to fix the medieval abuses, although a few of the radical reformers added new abuses, and some Protestants responded to the Anabaptists with their own abuses. The Radical Reformation protested against the Protestants and reformed even farther in many cases. And that brings us to the Catholic Counter-Reformation, based on the same categories. The Council of Trent did not really change the theology. They mostly solidified and entrenched it in reaction to the Protestants. And they did not change authority. They more strongly emphasized church leaders and tradition as an authority in response to the Protestants. They did not really change any of the church's rituals and practices but they did work to fix abuses. They took the opportunity to try to clean house and get rid of bad practices and bad leaders. And I describe this movement as Reformation without protest. They tried to fix abuses without changing anything Rome believed or did. And finally, is the English Reformation, using the same categories. At first, what we've seen so far they did not change theology, not officially at first, but gradually they became partly reformed, but only as far as was necessary to break away from Rome. They definitely changed authority. The basis of the English Reformation is that the Pope cannot tell King Henry what to do, period. At first, it was a question of who has the power, nothing else. Henry was the authority, not the Pope. That was not quite sola scriptura of the Protestants. Now, that is an overstatement, because by removing Roman authority, Henry opened the door to change in other areas. But those changes did come later. At first, the English church did not change the ritual. Not at first, but again, it opened the door for more change later. And on the question of fixing abuses, maybe. Obviously, the Roman church wasn't doing the abuses, and some things got better, but some things just changed from the Pope abusing people to Henry abusing people. But again, Henry made it possible for the later English church to make much more progress after him.
So I will describe this as protest without reformation. At first, it rejected the Roman Catholic Church, but changed little from what had gone before. Like I said, it opened the door for more change later. And the question is, would someone walk through that door? And that's largely the topic for the next module. But now let's pause and reflect. Try to put yourself in their shoes. If you were a pastor or normal churchgoer in this situation, what would you do? Especially if you were an English Protestant who had fled to Europe and who had seen the tremendous revival taking place there. Think about it. Think about the difficult situation you would be in and the frustration you would feel. The, the halfway compromise is the official legal policy that comes with punishment for doing church any differently. But you've seen so much better. You could say, don't rock the boat. Let's just get along. I don't want to risk getting in trouble. Or you could say, I cannot be satisfied. I know God has so much more that he has placed within our reach. Let's finish the Reformation. If that means I'm punished, I'm willing to pay that price. I must obey God rather than man. Now, remember that these people were born into a world of medieval superstition. They had lived without a Bible in their native language. And then many of them experienced the revival of hearing about God's grace in the gospel for the first time and had been radically changed. They had seen the wonderful things that were taking place on the continent, and they wanted more of that in England. They had been exposed to new theology and history, and therefore they saw the urgency and opportunity. So they could not just go along. So the start of the English Reformation, protest without Reformation, resulting in the Elizabethan settlement, could not go on forever in that compromised state. It left different groups either wanting to go forward or to go back. And we'll take up the rest of that history when we look at the Puritans in the next module. But for now, let's review. The English Reformation, so far, can be characterized as protest without reform. It was mostly the activity of the English royalty deciding the direction of the English church. Henry VIII rejected the Pope's authority. In Edward's reign, the country moved in a very reformed direction, but in Mary's reign, it strongly moved back to Roman Catholicism, even persecuting Protestants. And finally, in Elizabeth's reign, it moved back to moderately Protestant, and the Elizabethan settlement established the English church in a fairly but not fully Protestant form. And this left a tension that would carry on in subsequent history. And that brings us to some discussion and application questions. For these questions, I'm asking you to imagine that you were living at that time and experiencing these events. First, imagine that you were king or queen of England, or you were one of their royal advisors. In other words, imagine that you were in a position to actually influence the political and religious changes. What would you do? What would you try to change about the church? How would you respond to what you learned was happening in Germany and Switzerland, and why? And how would you bring about those changes? And back in the real world of your life today, are there any ways you can work towards those similar kinds of changes in your own situation? How is your situation similar to England back then? How's it different? What are the principles behind what you would have done back then in that situation, and how can you apply those principles today? Second, imagine that you were a pastor or congregant back in England at that time. If you were constrained by those political decisions which were out of your control, over which you had no influence, how would you have responded in that case? What would you have wanted to happen? What would you have done, and why? What would you have prayed for? How would your Christian life have been affected? And how can those kinds of responses apply to your life and ministry today? 
What kind of decisions beyond your control affect your life? What principles have you learned from the English Reformation that you can bring to bear on how you respond to them? And how should they affect what you do or don't do in your situation? And third, anticipating the later history we'll cover in the next module. If you lived in that time period, what would you want to happen next? If you were stuck in that tension of Elizabethan settlement, how would you want it to resolve, and why? How is your desire connected to what you've learned from Scripture and all the previous church history, including the Protestant Reformation? If that story were to get a happy ending, what would that look like? What would the perfect church look like in the context of England at that time, and how would you get there from the Elizabethan settlement? How would that be similar to your idea of a perfect church in your own time and place? And what principles have you learned in this section that might help you to get there? Describe the ways you can put those principles into practice. Now, I know for these questions, you don't yet have the full history or a lot of detail. So a lot of this is asking you to imagine and think through, but we'll come back to fill in some of those details in the next module. I just wanted to jumpstart your thinking about the situation and the possibilities and be thinking, where was God in this and where would he want these historical events to go? Now, of course, I can't forget the open-ended question. What else did you learn and how can you put it into practice? And now, as usual, I'm going to pause to give you an opportunity to work through and discuss these questions. And when we resume, I'll have some guiding principles that will hopefully clarify and solidify the things that you're learning. So, pause the video now. Now, we're back for some guiding principles. These will be a little brief because we stopped only partway through the story. We'll need to finish the whole story to see the big lessons, but there are a few things I want to suggest that you take to heart from what you've learned so far. First, notice that King Henry did not intend for Reformation, but God did. Henry just wanted to get out of his marriage and get out from under the Pope's power, but God had greater things in mind. It's similar to Joseph's reply to his brothers in Egypt. He said, you intended it for evil, but God intended it for good, to accomplish what is now being done. And there are many times when we cannot see that God is working, and yet he is. We don't understand what he's doing, but he is doing something good. He can even use bad people and stupid actions, which are done for selfish reasons, and turn them so that they eventually result in his glory and our benefit. Now, of course, that does not mean that those bad things are good, but it means that we can trust God when things happen that are beyond our control. And the second principle is that political decisions will never build the church, yet political decisions can hinder the church, at least to some extent. As the old saying goes, you can't legislate morality, but you certainly can legislate immorality. The decisions of the kings and queens of England certainly did have an impact on the English church of that time. And even in our country, the church cannot completely rise above the decisions of our culture and government leaders. The effects of these things have at least some influence on the church, for better or worse. Now, politics and cultural engagement is never the primary concern of the church. We are to worship God and make disciples, and those other things should never distract us from that. But part of the church's ministry should train people to make a difference in their world, and that includes making a difference in culture, society, and even politics. One of the people in your church could cast the vote that keeps a scoundrel out of office. One of the people you disciple could influence a decision that will protect godliness or save many lives. And many Christians together, working toward a godly Christian society, 
will make society better for everyone, including non-Christians. Honestly ask yourself, who has it better? Muslims living in a predominantly Christian society or Christians living in a predominantly Muslim society? Atheists living in a Christian society or Christians living in an officially atheist society? Now, history is very clear on that one. So, Henry and Edwards and Elizabeth's advisors, who influenced them in a good direction and benefited the church of their time, did good. They were principled and prepared and took advantage of the opportunities given to them by their positions and the opportunities they had in history. And they moved the country in a more reformed and more godly direction. And I think God was pleased with their work. And the pastors who faithfully pastored and the everyday Christians who lived faithful Christian lives, even in crazy changing circumstances, also did good. And they worked toward godliness in whatever spheres they had influence. And I believe God was pleased with that as well. Now, like I said, we have paused in the middle of the story, and there's more history to come in the English church, which we will cover in the next module. The church in England eventually did get, they did great good with worldwide implications, and we've only seen the beginning of the preparation for later greater things. And we only got a quick tour of all that happened in the period that we've covered so far. There is much more to learn if you want to go back and study in more depth. But I hope you now have a good overview understanding as well as a healthy curiosity for where this story is heading. And I pray that God continues to give you insight into why all this matters and how it applies to your life. In the next module, we will come back to the English Reformation. But in the second section of this module, we'll need to cover a different sequence of events that is important on its own, but it will also prepare us to understand the rest of the story of the English church. And so I hope that you'll join us in the next section. Thanks for watching.